Hello again. And uh, since this morning uh, not many people were present at Tate, I want to take again the opportunity to thank the organizing committee to invite me here. It has been so far a wonderful experience. I thank you very much for, uh, for this invitation. The topic of this presentation, uh, it's a little difficult for me. I'm a clinical researcher, and uh, I will talk about mainly basic research. Um, this would be an ideal topic for uh, Prabir Roy Chaduri. He has done most of the work regarding uh, prevention of fistula failure. So what I try to do is just to convey in a simple way what I think uh, are kind of difficult concepts. So I hope uh, I can share what I understood with you. These are again my disclosures. So when an AV access is created, uh, there are consequences. Uh, somebody says that uh, we induce a disease. Um, and uh, there is a big change, so there are consequences from the physiopathologic point of view on the vessels. And these are due to two events. First, a change in flow and a change in pressure. So we have been through this, which is the best AV axis. So the best AV axis, everybody agrees, is an AV fistula. But the point is that it is the preferred type of vascular access if they mature successfully because they require fewer intervention. And they also have lower rates of infection. They function longer than grafts and catheters, but if they mature successfully. So the, the point is exactly how to have fistulas that are actually mature. So the worst um, survival rate is for AVF in maturing is 60%. So up to 60% of AV fistula fail to mature. This uh, uh, data come from a very nice um, uh, systematic review. Dr. Locke is among the authors of this uh, review, which was published in American Journal of Kidney Disease in 2014 where we have the rates, the actual rates of primary fistula failure in most of the uh, articles that, uh, I would say all of the articles that were published at that, at that time. And the rate of primary fistula, in the average rate of failure is 23%. So when primary failures are included in the analysis, the primary patient's rate is 60% at one year and 51% at two years. And the other in interesting point of this uh, article is that in, in the most recent times, the primary patency rates are worse. And so this is one of the key figures. I just took only the years from 2008 and 2011, and you see that there are big differences in, uh, in individual uh, uh, articles uh, from something like about 5 to 7 percent of failure up to uh, 60 percent, and these were the articles of the DAC study. So how is the anatomy of the, uh, of the walls of the artery and vein? They are very similar, but uh, there are important differences. And also there are differences in what happens inside the vessels. So the artery, as everybody knows, has high blood pressure inside and pulsatile flow, while in the vein you have low pressure and continuous flow. And uh, anatomically, you see that uh, the tunica media is larger and there are uh, elastic uh, uh, materials, so there is an external elastic membrane and electric elastic fibers, and, uh, and therefore the uh, artery has a stronger um, uh, construction. But uh, when you create a fistula, the veins, the vein uh, is somehow is in the condition of an artery with a higher pressure and pulsatile flow. 
So what happens uh, that uh, when we consider physical uh, 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 concepts, we have pressure, pressure of blood on the wall, on the on the vein wall of, of the artery wall, the vessel wall, and this is defined as a perpendicular force which is exerted in the vessel. And then the other important physical concept is shear stress. This is parallel to the vessel, and, and uh, it's a force, therefore, which is exactly in the other direction uh, when we compare that to pressure. And at the cellular level, you see here, this is a cell, and you have the shear stress <coughs> coming here. So what happens? Because of the increased pressure uh, in the vein after a fistula creation, you will have a circumferential stretching. So the pressure will stretch the vessel. And the shear stress, which will also increase and will change also, because there, there will not be even, is exer exerted in the longitudinal uh, way. And you have strain here, and you have consequences on the, on the vein wall. So this is a, a drawing coming from a review, very nice review from uh, Dr. Mary Hammes, which was recently published. And uh, you can see that in this vessel, the direction of the blood is from the bottom to the top. You see that in this smaller part, you have laminar flow, while here, you have turbulence. So in this case, you have disturbed shear flow. And, and these are the consequences. While laminar shear will have a low endothelial cell turnover, the endothelial cells will preserve alignment. There will be low permeability. There will be uh, no induction of inflammatory genes and there will be a low oxidative stress. In this area where there is disturbed shear, you have the opposite. So in increased cell turnover, poor alignment, inflammatory genes will be um, turned on, hypermeability and oxid oxidative stress. So we know all the rule of six, which is more or less six. So this is the definition of characteristic of a mature AVF. So it's between 500 and 2 liters, 500 ml and 2 liters uh, per minute, considering that the uh, radial artery has a normal blood flow rate of uh, 25 to 50 at the most uh, milliliters per minute. The diameter should be at least five, 4 to 6 millimeters for uh, adequate support of dialysis. And these parameters should be met within 4 to 6 weeks. So the main research question, when we go back to the uh, concept of uh, uh, what is the science behind this, is that we should evaluate the relationship between the shear stress and the remodeling that takes over during maturation of an, of, uh, an ADF and also after maturation uh, during the uh, access life. Why do AV fistula fail to mature? It is possible that either the vein or the artery will not dilate as it is supposed to do. And this means that there is not an outward remodeling. I have a few pictures uh, regarding this. Usually, this is due to concomitant severe vascular disease of the patient. Then. The other important event is that neo-intimal hyperplasia may develop, and this can thick the vessel wall, and this can lead to a stenosis. The most common place for a stenosis in an AV fistula is close to the anastomosis, and as you know, in a graft is in the point where the graft is attached to the vein, because that is when the flow inside the axis changes, and you will have a change in shear stress. And then, of course, you can have a combination of these two events. So you can have problems with outward remodeling and 
uh, hyperplasia. And this is uh, the same concept that, ju that I just say in words. You can see it in a, in, a, in a figure. This is the ideal situation that we are looking for. Outward remodeling, the uh, diameter of the vein will increase nicely. On the other hand, we might have intimal hyperplasia if this develops towards the inside of the vessel, you will have a reduced lumen, and that is something that we don't want to see, so there would be the unsuccessful remodeling. And then we have something in the middle where you might, have, you, you might see some outward remodeling, which is good, but also the development of uh, myointimal hyperplasia. So to study this from the basic science uh, point of view, uh, I want to share with you uh, a couple of models, animal models of uh, uh, AV fistulas so that uh, we can study AV uh, failure. And the first one comes from the group of uh, Prabir and uh, it's a pig um, model. And uh, you see this very nice picture show two different way of constructing an AV fistula in this animal model. In this panel A, you have a, a curved configuration with a more large uh, flow. The flow will have a more large uh, uh, angle. You see the arrows that will show you how the blood comes from the proximal artery into the anastomosis and then into the vein. And the second panel is a straight configuration. And in the straight configuration, you see that here is again the proximal artery. The angle is more acute. So the, uh, the flow will be different and the shear stress will be different. So let's see what happens with these two different configurations. You see this is a kind of a short observation time, only one month and the very high blood flow rate, because this was done in the carotid artery and the jugular vein. So you see that we have here one liter per minute, and it goes up to three liters and two liters. Anyhow, considering that this is a very different situation from our patient, what is important is that in the same experimental situation, just because of the different uh, um, patterns of flow because the length of the anastomosis was exactly the same. But you see that uh, with the straight configuration, which was uh, the one with the more acute angle, the flow rate is less than with the curved configuration. So the conclusions of this uh, article on this model is that the study determined that the pig model is viable for uh, study AV access and that the AV fistula configuration can significantly affect the uh, hemodynamics of the fistula. Now let's talk about remodeling uh, a, a little bit more in detail. What is remodeling? That's the ability of living tissue to adapt to its environment by changing the shape and structure. And it modifies mechanical proteins. Uh, properties and it is driven by tendency to maintain the optimal levels of stress and strain. So in this figure here you see that uh, this is a real uh, reconstruction of uh, out of an experiment. You see a typical geometry, this is the artery and this is the enlarged vein, in the outflow vein and in healthy vein you will have no hyperplasia, and here you can see some hyperplasia already. And this is again a, a, a figure, the healthy vein, and the CKD vein from the very beginning, even before doing a this access surgery, you can have hyperplasia. So time is running out, so I think this reiterates the same concept. and. Uh, I want to, you to show you the other mechanism. So this is the summary regarding the modeling. So we have uh, pressure that will uh, exert circumferential stress or strain, and this is due 
the consequence is uh, vascular uh, smooth muscle cells hypertrophy and uh, hyperplasia and then you have an increase of synthesis of collagen then you will have a change of flow with the uh, uh, consequences that are mediated by endothelial cells and you will have migration of vascular smooth muscle cells and proliferation and then intimal hyperplasia and hypertrophy and finally you may have a combination of the of the two factors above with mechanical damage so the other uh, model that i wanted to show you was uh, again by the group of prabir and by the da the dutch group of uh, joris rotmans who is a young uh, uh, nephrologist very active in research and clinically he will organize the 2019 meeting uh, of the vascular access society in Rotterdam so they changed the animal this is very important so they went they switched from very big animal like pig to mice and uh, so this uh, model incorporates a clinically rele relevant configuration of the anastomosis and it displays features that are similar to the failing human uh, AV axis. So this is just an example. This is a very nice article if you want to go and, and take a look at that from 2014. And uh, you see from day zero, that's the control before the AV fistula, that's the appearance of the vein. And then you see here you have a thrombus as well, so don't consider the thrombus, but you can see that there is a, a outward remodeling, so the diameter is, is larger. And then by day 28, you have developed a severe uh, intimal hyperplasia. Why it is important? Because in mice, you can modify genetics. You can have transgenic animals. So you can disable genes that can play an important role in coagulation, inflammation, uh, vascular smooth muscle cell biology, and therefore this is a very interesting and important issue. And, uh, and with that, I think uh, uh, I'm, I'm done with the presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Gillini. It's over to the chairperson for the next Thanking question. Thanking Dr. Gillini for his under of his masterly discourses. Just one clinical relevant question. Is there any studies available regarding the systemic hypertension correlating with the AV fistula failure? Western systemic hypertension. So the question is, if I understood, I repeat if to understand. If patients with higher blood pressure, considering the strain on the fistula, will have a more... Uh, I don't think this has been addressed specifically. Um, and uh, it could be interesting to see. In theory, <clears throat> it's not only the pressure, because the pressure somehow can be a benefit, because the pressure itself will increase the dilation, so the outward remodeling. The point is the pressure combined with changes. So I think it's more important <clears throat> in determining hyperplasia and stenosis the change in sheer stress rather than increase in pressure. Uh, a lot of us work in live dollar transplant program and my uh, colleague co-chairs have huge experience. It is frequently observed that uh, the renal transplant recipients, they have uh, failure of their fistulas sometimes within 24 hours or within 72 hours uh, without actual episodes of hypotension during surgery. I, I often wonder what is the mechanism for this, is there anything else beyond what you explained, is there something immunological happening to these patients that their uh, fistulas get thrombus through freak so frequently. I want so, to know from you or my colleague chair. So you observed an increase in thrombosis after transplant, yeah. so, and the question is why? The answer is I don't know, but uh, um, it is possible that uh, you have uh, changes uh, in uh, immune function. That's, I think, the most obvious uh, uh, direction that I would uh, address is to see if uh, immunosuppression, which is induced, somehow might change uh, the answer. And then, of course, you might have hypotension during uh, uh, the surgery, 
And I think this is also another possible cause because, of course, if you have prolonged hypotension because of surgery, you might have failing fistula. We frequently see the closure of fistula immediately after a functioning graft rather than a graft which did not function primarily. So that may be the reason. Has yeah, diuresis has something to do with that. And not only that, we've seen the fistula failures immediately following a nephrectomy. So the patient pulse of something like polycystic kidney disease who has been undergoing a nephrectomy and suddenly we see the fistula failed immediately after that. We had number of times this kind of a situation yeah. uh, we faced. So there may be something which we need to really look into. Well, I, I think that every time you touch a human being, something happens, especially with major, <laughs> in every sense. <laughs> so that, that includes surgery and probably yeah. there are, there are uh, some kind of reaction that uh, yeah, we, we don't, we don't fully understand. Different. But I want to stress one thing regarding transplant. Don't forget about the V-axis because uh, I, I had a patient that got transplanted and uh, was sent back to my unit after uh, six or seven years because she had to go back into dialysis because she had um, uh, dyspnea, she had problems in breathing. And turns out, I will make a very short, she had a 2.5 liters access still working. So that was the problem. So creatinine was high, it was four, but I uh, decided to ligate actually, there was no possibility to do bending or other problems. Uh, so we li ligated the access and she could be able to go on for one more year. So the, the transplant uh, doctors did not look at that. Yeah, any question? Uh, sorry any for the interruption, from the Mr. Chairman. No yeah, problem. Yeah. Okay, yeah. thank you. Uh, you, know, you know, you brought out a very interesting concept about the remodeling and the shear stress along the entire length of the fistulous vein, I mean the outflow vein. Uh, does that mean that it would be, we'd be better off putting prosthetic grafts? Because at least that part is not going to happen. Only thing is going to be, I mean the, the shearing and the remodeling would only be at the anastomotic sites. Are you trying to say that that is probably a better uh, access conduit? Well, the concept is that you have the problem of uh, hyperplasia where the shear stress is unstable. Somehow, when, especially when it is reduced. I didn't have time to show you all the uh, articles that I read. But sometimes when the turbulence decreases the, 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 the shear stress, somehow the endothelial cells grow more. So when in the fistula, after a while, the flow will go laminar, laminar again, then you will probably not have much, so much hyperplasia. And that is the reason why you have usually more hyperplasia close to the anastomosis in AV fistula and close to the connection of the graft to the vein in, uh, in grafts. That, that, that's what I said. So, so would you say that if you were to place a prosthetic, a PTFP graft, this wouldn't happen? You would only have the problem at the anastomotic site and the rest of the... Yes, graft that is what we, so, so we are currently you to see. So that, that is better? But it's, a better it's not better because still uh, uh, the hyperplasia... The last question with Dr. Ashwin. Yeah, the, the hyperplasia of the vein uh, at the graft connection is more severe than the hyperplasia in the AV fistula. Very nice presentation. And actually I'm surprised at the results of uh, US RDS uh, data that primary success rate of AV fistulas between 43 to 47 percent. Is it due to the technique which is there uh, in forming the fistula? Because many times what we see that if there is angulation between artery and vein or if there is nerve crossing the vein or uh, so many tributaries, if you do not ligate them, then flow will uh, definitely divert from the major vein. And we used to and we are still tying the t uh, tributaries. Uh, if there is any nerve fiber crossing the vein, uh, we just uh, cut it and angulation we uh, control it by uh, separating it from the adjacent tissue. And if you uh, make all these things and vein is, because vein is the most stretchable uh, uh, organ in the AV fistula and we always dilate the vein with the uh, venous uh, arterial dilators which are there from 2 millimeters to 8 millimeters then our primary fistula failures are uh, very less, less than 5%. So, uh, 
so sí. if your first fistula is made properly i think a uh, lot of interventions lot of angioplasties they are uh, unnecessary and in our centers we are hardly going for these angioplasties and all that and if you have made all these th uh, things uh, rightly uh, your vein is already remodeled because in second part of your presentation you have said about remodeling and remodeling can be initiated right from the first point when you make the fistula yeah, thank uh -huh. you yeah, I, I'm not sure I understood everything, but the point is that uh, if you have such a low 5%, did I get it right, no. um, failure rate, uh, you should write uh, a, an article sending me to a journal so that I, I, I will better understand exactly how you do it. Uh, consider that what we realize, at least in Italy, is that uh, the failure rate of AV fistula are higher than you suspect when you consider, and you should always consider, very early failure. So if the patient comes to the operating room today, and in two days the uh, AV fistula is closed, and you go back and you do the same intervention, that is not the same AV fistula. Though the first one was failed, and then you have a second one. So when you count everything, then uh, failure rates increase a little bit. So this is the, the first thing I want to say is that you should be very precise in assessment of the, of the failure. Okay, um, but uh, saying that, just please let us know how you do a 5%. Yeah, I'm sorry for the interruption, yeah. Mr. Chairman. We have totally run out of time for the yes. discussion of this presentation. Yeah. We'd thank like you. to thank all the chairpersons and our speakers. Thank you all. And we'd request to kindly join us for the presentation ceremony.